is that when you open the can of worms of hermeneutical spiritualization or uh, exegetical or you know uh, metaphorization yeah when you open that can of worms what is left of christianity is basically mythological then i will say what makes this myth better than any other myth what's what, why are we investigating the myth of christianity and not for example the myth of hercules and zeus why is uh, the figure of father and son and the holy spirit more important to me than the mithraic uh, would you call it Trinity? Jordan Peterson has put an interesting spot here, and I wish he actually answers differently than he does. You asked me a theological question, so I'm going to address that. So I've been trying to understand from a psychological perspective, for example, why people have been gazing on the figure of the crucifix for 2,000 years. Now, not everyone, and, and doctrinal differences apart, it's still many people for 2,000 years, and that begs a question. Obviously, there's something about that image that's gripping. So when Jordan Peterson is asked a theological question, he comes with a philosophical answer. He even recognizes that. And at this point, it's when I wish he would have let Jonathan Pajau speak to answer the question that Muhammad Hijab has brought forward. Because this question about is Christianity just a myth is one that gets asked and talked about by a lot of people. And so this stage would have been a great stage to be able to talk about why I believe and why I think Jonathan also believes and at the heart of it, why I also think Jordan believes Christianity isn't just a myth. I think there's something here for us to talk about that's helpful for the believer and the non-believer. So if you're here and you're not a Christian, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Hopefully this helps give you some insight into how a Christian approaches reading the biblical text. And it's going to be a little bit different than what Muhammad Hijab has put forward. Ultimately, the Bible isn't about me. It's not about you. The Bible, however, is for me and for you. And that distinction is really important to make here at the beginning because that will take us from reading the Bible just purely spiritualistically or metaphorically, always putting us at the center. We call that eisegesis. Instead, looking at the Bible, understanding its historical context and the literature that we're reading, and instead of bringing things and putting them on top of the text, we try to read and get to the meaning of what the original text says. We call that exegesis, reading out of the text instead of into it. So what Muhammad Hijab has done has said that when you read the text all metaphorically, it's just myth, no different than Zeus or Greek mythology or all this. So Jordan, why do you talk about Christianity more than you do these other religions? Does that mean that you think Christianity isn't a myth? And I think Jordan was being very diplomatic with his answer, but unfortunately he also didn't give a clear answer. He goes from talking about what he said there in the clip to going further into Numbers 21 and talking about the serpents in the desert and how that's connected to what Jesus says and how that's all kind of connected to this image of the cross. And so he spends time talking about the imagery of the cross and the crucifixion as opposed to the historical event and its significance as stated by Jesus. What I would like to do is to look at John chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, because I think it's helpful when Jesus here outlines how this Old Testament strange story isn't just about a historical event, though it is, but that historical event was foreshadowing something deeper and bigger and had more meaning. If you're interested in stuff like this, where looking at the Old Testament and seeing how Jesus is interwoven through all of the text of the Old Testament, check out my description where I'll link a channel called Jesus in Five, where he goes through all of these Old Testament texts and shows how they foreshadow and link back to Christ. It's really worth it. Hope you like that. Anyway, back to what we're going to talk about today. We're going to take a look at John chapter Three. Numbers 21, there's this story where the snakes are going throughout the camp and people are getting bit and poisoned because of their disobedience, because of their idolatry. And so uh, a bronze serpent is made and held up in front of the people. And those who gazed upon the bronze serpent and trusted in God were saved and did not die. 
Jesus, in a meeting with Nicodemus, who was a teacher of that day, a Pharisee who comes in the middle of the night because he didn't want to be ridiculed by his friends for going to this teacher, this rabbi who'd been walking around and preaching and teaching and apparently doing miracles and claiming to be God, all these things. He he was curious, but his pride held his curiosity back from being able to be seen by everybody else. So he comes to ask Jesus questions and Jesus tells him basically the gospel. To enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to be born again. You have to be made alive. We'll see that Paul later on will talk about how we're dead in our sin and trespasses, but we're made alive in Christ. That when we trust in the sacrifice of Christ, this son of man that's talked about by Jesus here, when our faith and trust is put there, we are then born again, made alive. We're not just born of the flesh, but born of the spirit. That can only be done by God. Then we come to Verse 13, where he says this, speaking to Nicodemus, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man, the word became flesh who dwelt among us. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Just like those who looked and gazed and believed upon what God would do and promise through the serpent, so too. Those who gaze upon and believe in what God has promised to do through Jesus Christ on the cross will be saved, will have eternal life. This is not a metaphor. The the story of the snakes in the wilderness is not a metaphor. The cross is not a metaphor for all of human suffering. That's what Jordan goes into, and that isn't what Scripture is teaching. When we look at the Bible, we have to read what we're reading in the context of what was written. Is this historical narrative? Is it poetry? Is it apocalyptic? Is it wisdom literature? Is it a letter to someone else? What is it that we're reading will determine how we read the passage? Are there metaphors used in scripture? Absolutely. Does Jesus use metaphors to teach? Absolutely. When I go and I read Revelation or I read other apocalyptic literature or I read the story of David and Goliath, I'm not putting myself in the place of David. I'm not David and neither are you. That story of David and Goliath isn't about God defeating your giants for you. No, that story is a foreshadowing of what God can do, but man cannot. What is it that God can do that man cannot? Defeat sin and death. So in a story of a little shepherd boy who is going out against insurmountable odds, laughed at for doing what he's doing, but he's trusting in God the entire way. And what happens? God gets the victory over where man could not. You see, that's not a metaphor. It's a historical story. If you're interested to learn about more about how the Bible is history, check out this video here that I did recently looking at the Mount Ebal tablet that was just found this past year and how archaeology backs up what scripture says. Friends, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it if you leave a like on the video and I'll catch you on the next one. Remember, faithfulness is pursued together. Peace.